Good evening. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of Heather Campion, CEO of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming and acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. In 1961, Robert F. Kennedy remarked, we know that it is the law which enables us to live together that creates order out of chaos, and we know that if one individual's rights are denied, the rights of all others are endangered. When John F. Kennedy made the unorthodox choice to name his brother Robert to serve as United States Attorney General, he quipped to the small group of journalists who had gathered for the announcement I can't see why it's wrong to give him a little legal experience before he goes out to practice law. <laughs> With both a scowl and sharp retort, Robert Kennedy showed his displeasure at the comment to which JFK remarked, come on, Bobby, don't be so serious. You have to make, learn to make fun of yourself. To which RFK, with both a lawyer's precision and a younger brother's scorn, replied, you were not making fun of yourself, Jack. You were making fun of me. As we know, and in the estimation of many historians, the political alliance forged between the two Kennedy brothers is unrivaled in our nation's history. And Robert Kennedy is viewed by many as one of our nation's finest attorney generals, effectively wielding the powers of his office to build a more equitable, just, and united states of America. In recognition of those efforts in 2001, President George W. Bush renamed the Justice Department after him, and no less than the most Recent former occupant of that building's highest office, Eric Holder, cited Robert Kennedy as his role model. Just over a year ago, the voters of this state elected Mara Healey to serve as the people's lawyer, continuing her long career spent fighting for justice and equal rights in our commonwealth. John Kennedy, who believed in the nobility of public service and perfected the art of the insurgent political campaign, would surely have looked favorably on her historic victory in a first ever run for elected office, driven by a strong grassroots effort where she bested two well-financed and formidable adversaries in a spirited and substantive campaign of ideas. While JFK's success put an end to the so-called religious test for a higher office, Mara Healy proved that one's sexual orientation need not be a barrier to winning a statewide office in Massachusetts. She is the first openly gay state attorney general in the nation. Before her election, Ms. Healy was a senior leader in the state's attorney general's office, serving in a number of roles, including as chief of the civil rights division. She's also a former Middlesex County prosecutor and was the starting point guard for a professional basketball team. Her life experience has prepared her well, one senses, in boxing out special interests so that the people's business can be done, in understanding that while she was elected by a majority of Massachusetts voters, that the minorities living among us must have their rights protected and not be subject to the whims of the ballot box, and in informing her judgment that while law enforcement plays a crucial role in protecting our communities for some societal ills, it represents only one part of a multifaceted solution and must be applied in concert with other public policies and private initiatives. While we do not presume that everyone in this audience agrees with her on every issue, that is why we offer these forums to foster a dialogue in which our differences of opinion can be discussed. I hope I speak for others in saying, in times as perilous as these, that we are all united in wishing you success, Attorney General Healy, and protecting our interests and keeping us safe. You honor us with your presence here tonight and we thank you for coming. You. Let me add two brief personal notes as I conclude these remarks. This happens to be the last forum introduction I will deliver as director of the Kennedy Library, and there's an interesting historical connection to earlier times. When I was hired 16 years ago as director of education, one of my very first tasks was to help plan a major day-long conference on citizenship and service to help mark the library's 20th anniversary. We wanted to include as many surviving members of the Kennedy era, the likes of Ted Sorensen and Harris Wofford, and so I wrote an invitation to Newt Minow, 
who served in the Kennedy administration as chair of the Federal Communications Commission and who may have done more in that role than any FCC chair in history, engaging the public at a pivotal moment in an informed dialogue concerning how best to regulate the media so that it better serve the public interest. He is also, of course, and perhaps most importantly, the father of our moderator this evening, Dean of the Harvard Law School, Martha Minow. Over the past 16 years, many of us here have gotten to know Dean Minow through her service as a member of the Kennedy Library Foundation's Profile and Courage Award Committee. She's one of the most dedicated members of that group, dutifully attending meetings, ceremonies, and becoming a central member not only of that august committee, but also of our professional team here with her ethical judgment, seasoned wisdom, and remarkably unassuming manner. I truly cannot think of anyone I am prouder to have invited to moderate the last Kennedy Library Forum that I had a hand in organizing. One final anecdote. The first and only state attorney general's office I have ever been in was years ago as a college student in my home state of Maine. And I'm so pleased that the occupant of that office at that time, Jim Tierney, is here with us tonight, along with his wife, the novelist Elizabeth Strout. Mr. Tierney now teaches at Harvard and Columbia Law Schools, educating those who aspire to serve in attorney general's offices throughout the country. But what I learned firsthand from watching Jim Tierney in action was that while we are a nation of laws, those laws do not apply themselves automatically to the challenges of our time, but require the thoughtful and creative application by those we elect to administer justice on our behalf as best they can. That too is the lesson we learned from the history of Robert Kennedy, whose years as Attorney General helped to build a more equitable nation. And it is also what we sense with great portent from this Commonwealth's newest Attorney General, whose heart seems as large as her mind is sharp, and who demonstrates a seemingly tireless resolve to face the legal challenges of our time, enabling us, in the words of Robert Kennedy, to live together, to create order out of chaos, and to ensure that our rights and the rights of our neighbors are not endangered. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mara Healy and Martha Minow to the Kennedy Lab. Well, Tom, let me thank you for that wonderful presentation and introduction. And I think we all want to salute Tom, who's done just a spectacular mm -hmm. job. General? <laughs> you call me Mara. You can call me anything you want to. <laughs> then you call me Martha. <laughs> okay. I get it, called that sometimes. People still get confused. <laughs> it is such, such an mm -hmm. honor to be here with you. And my first question to you, besides what do I call you, is to, to walk us through your career choices and your, your life. Uh, was there a plan? Was it serendipity? Mm -hmm. How did this come to pass? Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question, but I too want to especially acknowledge Tom's contributions, his leadership of this incredible institution, um, an institution I've had the pleasure of visiting uh, for many, many years now, and your stewardship, your vision, your leadership, you have certainly made your mark and left an indelible mark. I also appreciate that as a librarian, you really did wonders to pull out those sports analogies for this <laughs> former basketball player. But in all seriousness, thank you so much for the contributions you have made and given uh, to our community and to the world that passes through these doors day in and day out. So another hand for our good friend Tom Cutler. So plan? No, there was no plan. Um, really, you were born in New Hampshire. I, I was. I was born. I was actually born at Bethesda Naval Bethesda. Hospital, uh -huh. Hospital down in Maryland, but had uh, I think all of about nine months there before my folks headed back this way. They're from Newburyport on the North Shore, and we settled just over the border in a small town in Hampton Falls, New Hampshire, about five miles in the shadows of Hampton Beach and the Seabrook Nuclear Station. Actually, I remember growing up as a kid. There were protesters that. 
uh, paraded through our streets and I think camped out even on our property, uh, members of the Clamshell Alliance. So I saw social protest in action from an early age. But my, my perspective is formed really by my family. I'm so lucky to have had the support of my parents, my grandparents, my mother's a school nurse, my dad uh, worked for the federal government, my stepfather is a teacher and a coach. Um, he was my basketball coach, so I actually owe him uh, a great wow. deal in particular. But as the oldest of five children growing up in this small family, I think we all learned a lot about values and principles from them. They were really engaged in their community, involved in their community, and impressed upon us without saying so directly that it was important to pay attention. It was important to be engaged. It was important to be involved in your community. And that didn't matter if it was everything from being on a conservation commission to serving uh, as a selectman to uh, starting our Troop 374. I remember being seven years old and I wanted to be a brownie and I asked my mom about these brownies and our town didn't have a brownie troop and <laughs> she up and started the brownies. So um, that's sort of how I, how I grew up, went to public school there and then went on to, to Harvard. I knew from an early age I wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah, I had, I had the opportunity, I think I was about third or fourth grade, and there was this enrichment program, and you got to go spend a day with somebody who had a career that you might like to explore. So I chose to go to work for the town lawyer for the day. And um, in fact, there was a picture of this during the campaign, just to, just to show people. I was pretty serious about this whole lawyering <laughs> business. So back in third grade, I sat with her for an afternoon, and um, I really did believe that I wanted to be a lawyer because I wanted to be an advocate. And, and I thought about the law as a tool uh, through which and by which you could help people. I also knew that I didn't want to go to law school right away. Um, and so when I graduated from college, I think I was 21 at the time, and knew I wanted to, to do a few things before I went to law school. And I chose the most unlikely path, which was to pursue a professional basketball career. I didn't want to get a real job. Um, over in Europe and had a chance to do that, see the world, uh, live a little bit, and then return here to Boston, where I went to Northeastern, and then began, after that, uh, a terrific and incredibly fulfilling legal career. Well, and what a distinguished one it is. You were a law clerk, you were a special assistant district attorney, you became the chief of the Civil Rights Division of uh, the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office, and then uh, beyond, the chief of the Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau, the chief of the Business and Labor Bureau. Which of those jobs did you feel gave you the chance to do something that you had hoped to do most, and which was like a new challenge? Yeah. Well, when I left private practice, I, I clerked for Judge Mazzoni, who, by the way, was the judge who ordered the cleanup of the Boston Harbor. And I learned from him the value of government. He believed in government. He believed in good government and the possibility of good government. And uh, through that case, I learned so much uh, through, through, uh, through my work with him. And really part of the seed for wanting to, to, to pursue public interest and public interest lawyering. But I did go to Hale and Door, which was wonderful, uh, Wilmer Hale, for many years, about eight years, as a business litigator. But I made a decision to take, I think what was then a 70% pay cut, wow. to become head of the Civil Rights Division, and I made the seamless transition from securities litigator to uh, civil rights <laughs> uh, chief. <laughs> because I had this abiding passion for civil rights and, and what that was about, and justice, and, and, and the possibility of using the law to do some good. And, in that role, um, and I give great credit to my predecessor, Martha Coakley, who allowed us to pursue this case, but we brought the nation's first successful challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act, and I was a lead counsel on that case, worked with a terrific team um, in the office, and we challenged the federal government um, alongside the legal team at GLAAD, who brought a case on behalf of the plaintiffs, and that was an incredible experience and certainly uh, couldn't have asked for a better uh, example or, or, or reason of, for why I was making the move from the private sector to the public sector. And um, we know how that story ended and, uh, and to me it's an illustration of 
of the power and the possibility of that law, of law. Well, you really made history with that uh, case and with what it led to. There really was an insightful approach, particularly coming from your office, that it's about federalism. It's about letting the states have some control. So how, did you think about it that way or was it just a stepping stone to the broader rights? Um, well, this was all about strategic litigation. Yes. This was about you know, thinking how do we use the laws and formulate claims that ultimately would be successful at the Supreme Court because I think we knew at the outset that ours was a case that would end up at the yes. Supreme Court and indeed it ended up at the Supreme Court. Um, the folks at GLAAD were able to frame a case uh, that told the stories of families in very powerful ways, um, in the ways that, that they, were, they were hurt by, by DOMA. And as a state bringing in action, you have to think, and I'm looking out at Jim Turney, um, you have to think about an actual claim you can make as a state. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things we thought about was, we're gonna tell the tale of equal protection, and we are gonna talk about stories, and we're gonna talk about the way that Massachusetts mm -hmm. same-sex couples are treated differently than other couples and, and put in this second class category. But we're also gonna have to articulate a harm to the state, beyond the harm to the dignity and the respect of couples and their families. And so I thought it was a sort of fun to be able to turn what had been traditionally a conservative argument Absolutely. of federalism and apply it to a gay rights case. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And we basically took the position that for uh, as long as we can remember, states have had control to, to license marriages and to set the rules for marriage. Right. And all we're asking federal government is for you to do what you've always done and respect our determination. So it was a federalism argument um, that ultimately, I think you see uh, the, the threads and the strains of that um, in, in, this, in the court's decisions uh, out of the First Circuit um, and ultimately out of the Supreme Court. And, um, I'll just say that we had a lot of fun uh, thinking about, strategically sort of thinking about how to, how to bring that case. But it was, it was just great. I gotta tell you that uh, to flash forward three, four, five years, we brought the case back in 2009 and a lot of people tried to talk us out of it, said it was a loser, uh, too much too soon, too don't, soon. don't do it. Um, and I'm glad we stayed the course and it was really terrific that for me personally and poignant, um, that the first brief filed in the Supreme Court with my name on it as Attorney General this time was in the marriage equality case uh, earlier this term. And obviously we were celebrating like crazy on June 26 when the court issued its decision. Phenomenal. You have made your career in the state and uh, I'm wondering how you think about priorities right now in Massachusetts. Well, there are so many issues. I mean, that's one of the great things about this job. And I absolutely love the job. I love the office. And I am so blessed to work with such terrific colleagues who are really giving it their all every day. And we need that because the challenges we face as a state are great. We've got a terrible crisis on our hands with a heroin opioid uh, addiction. We have gun violence that continues to plague and ravage communities and neighborhoods. We have growing income inequality and real concerns. Families are so concerned about the economic security and, and, and welfare uh, for their families, for their kids. I think we have an impending crisis around student loans right now and student lending. And, and there's just so much. Uh, ground to cover, which is what makes, I think, the job exciting. But it's also really important that we, as an office, prioritize and that we find ways to leverage and work with partners in government, at the local, state, mm -hmm. and federal level, with business, mm -hmm. uh, with nonprofits, with academe, mm -hmm. because to truly solve problems and, and make a dent on, um, on the problems we have today, I think we need to find a way to do all we can to leverage and harness what, what we have here in Massachusetts. And we've got great human capital, we've got great intellectual capital, um, we've got businesses that care. It's a great place to be, and it's a great place to be Attorney General. What can your office do about gun violence? I think that there is 
uh, a lot we can do. I think that ultimately uh, we need the federal government to step up and we need Congress to act. I am so dismayed that right now in this country, more toddlers were killed last year than members of law enforcement by wow. guns. Gosh. Just think about that. More toddlers were killed by guns than members of law enforcement. So yeah. you sort of scratch your head and say, you know, post, post Sandy Hook, I mean, a new town, I mean, what, what more does it take, right? What, what more does it take? And so we'll continue to advocate and make the case um, to those in D.C. who I think have abdicated their responsibility, have uh, given a pass to gun manufacturers, and have turned their backs on the children of this country. Wow. What we're going to do right now in this state is we're going to make sure that we're doing everything we can to crack down on the trafficking of illegal guns. But here's the problem. We live in a state, and I grew up on the border, yeah. Where until and unless we have a federal solution that better controls the flow of guns and the ease with which people are able to purchase guns, we're never going to get there entirely. But I think that we can work and we will continue to work um, to address the trafficking of guns, to uh, work with young people. One of the interesting programs I participated in a little while back was a program here where uh, women have organized, these are women who lost primarily sons to gun violence. And they're taking this back, and they're taking their communities back, and they're training their young girls, daughters, sisters, to not be straw buyers or purchasers mm. of guns for boyfriends or brothers. Mm. Increasingly, it's women that are going to jail for gun offenses. We need to close the loopholes that exist around the, some of the private sales of guns. Too easy for people to buy guns and sell guns to people who shouldn't, shouldn't be um, having guns. We need to close uh, the, some of the loopholes that exist around the, the, the uh, flow of information. Um, there are gaps, I think, in our local, state, and federal systems, and we need to fix that, and that's something that we're working on. And I think everything should be on the table, from micro-stamping of bullets so that we can better trace uh, illegal gun activity um, to uh, smart gun technology, and how do we use that? Mm -hmm. How do we incent that in the marketplace? Looking at issues around insurance, looking at issues around liability, um, and fixing what was wrongly done, I believe, years ago in creating uh, the loophole for gun manufacturers to not be liable. So those are some of the things that we're working on, um, and and there's a lot of there's a lot of work to do, Martha. But um, it is just heartbreaking when it becomes sort of so normalized when we turn on the 11 o'clock news and we see a report of another shooting, and you know that's somebody's son, that's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's parent. It's just not right. There's a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health who says that this really is a public health issue. Mm. And if we brought public, public health approaches, we would talk about redesigning guns and use the analogy mm -hmm. to uh, actually auto accidents. So about 30 years ago, lots of people died in, on highways. Mm -hmm. And people actually said, cars don't kill people, people kill people. Mm -hmm. We've heard that, mm -hmm. right, with mm -hmm. regard to guns. And he said, well, what happened was a series of public health-driven uh, efforts to redesign cars, redesign traffic. There might be ways in which you know, the, the Attorney General's office and, and criminal justice could work along with public health approaches. Absolutely, and, and we've been looking at some of those studies, and I think that's a case that, that we need to make. Um, and to stand up to the NRA, to stand up to the powerful lobbyists on this issue because I think of those toddlers and I think of the innocents gunned down in communities and neighborhoods across our state and certainly across this country and we need to say enough is enough. You mentioned student debt and I, I mm. put that in the context of consumer issues generally but how, how much is the problem people are being misled? How much is the problem we've had a terrible economic downturn? Uh, higher education has uh, escalated its tuition. What, what's the nature of the problem, or what are the tools you have available? Well, I think this is such a significant problem. I, I, I tend to think that what we see with student debt is akin to what we saw with the mortgage crisis. I do think that student lending in this country and student debt is the next great crisis. 
uh, for our economy. And why do I say that? Well, right now, I think we're $1.4 trillion in debt, in student debt right now. And these are people who are beginning their careers. And we're talking about tomorrow's employees. And, and, and you have to think, um, how is it that these kids today are going to be able to pay off those loans, let alone afford a house, let alone afford to raise children and a family, and do the things that are necessary to, to grow and sustain and have a vital economy. So there's a lot we can do in the office. One of the hats that we wear uh, as Attorney General is that of consumer advocate, to really be there to make sure that consumers aren't getting taken advantage of, aren't getting victimized. And we've taken steps um, already. We've gone after some of these predatory for-profit schools that market themselves by promising terrific careers where people are gonna earn salaries of X number of dollars. And they lure these students in with really high pressure sales tactics. 90% of their dollars are spent on marketing to students. They get them in the door, they sign the bottom line, and by signing the bottom line, they have signed themselves up for decades, uh, uh, boatloads of non-dischargeable debt. So the companies make out uh, because what happens, most of these students who are target are veterans or service members who qualify for GI Bill money, yes. or they're low-income folks who qualify for federal loans, many of whom are single moms looking for a leg up through an educational experience. and. Uh, these entities don't care. They don't care because they're just a pass-through. The students are just a pass-through uh, for investors to get their money on our federal taxpayer money, line their pockets. Does this sound familiar to some of what we saw with the subprime lending mess? Wow. I, I think it does. Um, so we have gone after uh, we have gone after those uh, kinds of entities, but we're also looking at problems that we see with loan servicing. Those companies mm -hmm. uh, that are out there, the Sally Mays and the Navians of the world, they, these Nell Nets, these servicers are not doing what they're supposed to be doing when students need to refinance or can be moved into a different uh, model. And we've also gone after some of the debt consolidators. A lot of companies are out there marketing to students yes. and families saying, we'll save you, come with us, we'll consolidate your debt. And what ends up happening is they just have fees tacked on and again, they end up further behind, deeper in the hole than ever before. So we need to be aggressive. Um, this is an area where our office has worked very closely with Senator Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that today, the United States Department of Education has an opportunity mm -hmm. to step up mm -hmm. and act and make sure that uh, more responsible loans are being made yeah. and that students are being helped in the process. That's really good to hear, and I'll pass it on to my students. <laughs> okay. We just uh, we do have a hotline actually for students uh, because this issue is so prevalent. So One prevalent. of the things we did is uh, we have a hotline now in the office for those who are having trouble with their student loan, and we'll actually work with you in the servicer right. to try to uh, help to get you into something affordable that that works with you and. You know, this is the problem. The, the, the servicers have fallen down. They're not doing their job. Right. So right. we want to step in with some resources today for students in Massachusetts and their That's families. Fantastic. This is a moment in the country when criminal justice reform is very much um, in the public eye, mm -hmm. where sentencing reform may actually happen in the Congress. Um, are there things that Massachusetts can do? Are we a leader? Are we behind? There's a lot we can do. Um, I look, at, I look at criminal justice reform uh, through the lens of civil rights. When I think about the disparities that exist and the disproportionate rates of incarceration, there are many things that lead to incarceration, but, and there can be debate and discussion about that, but the fact of the matter is that here in Massachusetts, if you're African American, you're six times more likely to be incarcerated than if you're white. If you're Latino, I believe it's four times, or three times. So, I mean, those are the facts, and, and one only you know, needs to, to walk into a community court tomorrow, or uh, a jail, or house of correction, or our uh, state prisons, to see that the demographics in those places don't match up with the demographics of the population. Now, I am heartened that 
we are having a national discussion about this. I am heartened that we are having a very real discussion in Massachusetts about this. There are things that we can do. We need to invest in programs that support efforts to keep particularly young people out of the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. to give them opportunities in programming and support to keep them out of the criminal justice system. Basketball. You know, it's a small thing, but, but it's um, and sports yeah. is not for all, but I do spend a lot of time playing basketball with kids because, you know, where funding has been cut for after school activities, uh, where libraries are closed on weekends or evenings, um, this is a problem. Why do I say that? Because, you know, I think about libraries. One of the greatest predictors of whether a kid is going to end up in college or in jail is a third grade literacy level. How important is it that we invest not only in early education, but also uh, prenatal, neonatal care? Um, we need to take care of these young people, um, and we need to understand the fact is in Massachusetts today, 72% of juveniles in our DYS system are foster kids, have been through the DCF wow. system. Wow. It's not surprising, really, when you think about it, but that's why those sorts of investments are important. I think we need to do a lot more in investing in successful reentry we call it, right? The fact of the matter is so many people who are incarcerated are going to get out and they need to be prepared to do well. Uh, that's how we break recidivism. That means more counseling, more job training. It's heartbreaking. I sat with a number of women at the Suffolk House of Correction recently. All of them to a person had been victims of violence, mm -hmm. sexual abuse. Nearly all of them uh, had drug addiction issues and mental health. And I mean, that's the reality uh, um, uh, of, of, of much of what you see. So investing in efforts to better prepare people um, to get out, and certainly looking at sentencing. Um, I've advocated for elimination of certain mandatory minimums. Yes. I think that's important. I think that removing barriers to people's success. I went after the FCC for charging, uh, for allowing the uh, charging of exorbitant phone call rates. One of the things that we think is important is that people who are incarcerated maintain ties with their family, yes. maintain ties with their yes. mother, maintain ties with their child. But I met a woman who had to take an extra job just to afford the extra two, $300 a month it cost her to call her son in prison. That's wrong. We gotta get rid of that. We need to get rid of the automatic suspension of driver's licenses for those who are convicted of drug offenses. I met a young man, he got convicted of a marijuana offense, went to the house, got out, wanted to get his job back at the mall, but can't get a driver's get license that. back because he can't afford the $800 it's gonna cost him. Not only is he unable to get to his job down the South Shore Mall, he lives in, in Roxbury, he can't take his grandmother to her medical appointments. He can't pick up his young brothers and sisters from school. These hurt us. These uh, not only are barriers for that individual, they're a barrier and a burden for that individual's whole family. And we've got far too many families, African-American families, with far too many of their members in jail, incarcerated, and that's had a significant impact on their health and well-being, the ability of these families to accumulate wealth, and as somebody who cares a lot about creating opportunities for all, criminal justice reform is where we need to be and we need to lead in Massachusetts. Can you explain this opioid crisis? Where did it come from? What are the reasons that it's particularly difficult here? And again, what can you do? Well, I have to say, Martha, I was blown away when I was campaigning. I think I was campaigning for, what, a year and a half or, uh, or more. And no matter where I went, rural, city, suburban, community, I could be in a room with lawyers, I could be in a room with bankers, I could be in a room with uh, grassroots organizers. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, somebody would come up to me afterwards and say, I have a problem with my son. Uh, I have a problem with my brother. And I saw this, this, uh, this phenomenon taking place where 
there was this silent but absolutely deadly creeping epidemic of heroin and, and, and opioid um, uh, abuse and, 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 and just devastation. Where did it come from? I'm not sure. I'll tell you a couple things. The Northeast has been particularly hard hit by this epidemic. Here in Massachusetts, four out of five of our heroin users today started with prescription pain medication. Wow. Heartbreaking to hear from so many parents who had children um, who were so successful in high school, who were injured playing sports and were prescribed painkillers. Mm -hmm. And then in a year or two or three times, found themselves uh, using heroin. People who were uh, who went to the dentist for, for surgery and were prescribed painkillers and found themselves hooked. People who were injured at work, same story. What I also have come to understand is that here in America, we're just 5% of the world's population, but we consume 80% of the world's opioid supply. 80%. I think we are a pill-happy culture. I think we are a pill-dependent culture, and I think we are paying the price. And from my perspective, you know, within the office, and this has been an area where I've worked really closely with Governor Baker, um, and I think he is right on and being aggressive mm -hmm. about things. Um, we have done everything from look at the marketing and sales practices of pharmaceutical companies, look mm -hmm. at the prescribing practices of doctors and dentists, and the dispensing practices of pharmacies, mm -hmm. look at what the barriers are to people being able to access treatment. What are the issues around insurance? And, and what is Self-medication going on here. Well, or, you know, there, there are any number of ways that people get into it, but yeah. once they're into it, yeah. we have a shortage of beds, we have a shortage of programs, and fundamentally, Martha, I think it's because, and we talk a lot about mental health parity law, I think the reality is we don't treat addiction, we don't treat mental health, we don't treat substance use in the same way that we treat heart disease and diabetes. And we're paying a price for that now. Um, so we've been really active on it, um, um, on, uh, and on the fronts I just listed, but also working to make Narcan more available yes. to first responders. I got really concerned about potential price gouging and what we saw with the increase in, in, in price in the midst of this crisis. And um, we reached out to the manufacturer. We were able to secure an agreement wow. to be able to bulk purchase the drug at a, at a much lower cost and get that in the hands of, mm -hmm. of first responders. And you know, educate about the law too. People need to know about Good Samaritan law. They need to understand that it's okay to call the police if somebody's ODing, you won't get in trouble. This is about saving lives. So a lot of, um, a lot of work to be done. It is uh, definitely a public health crisis and in law enforcement it is recognized for what it is, which is a public health crisis. Where does medical marijuana fit in this? I don't really, people ask me that and I really put it in a separate mm -hmm. bucket. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that one of the things I think needs to happen is we need to be exploring alternatives to opioids when it comes to pain management. And we should train medical students about yes. it and we should train doctors about yes. it and we should make sure that they get reimbursed for being able to, to, to pursue those avenues. Um, you know, that's important. Um, medical marijuana is available now in the state. I know it took some time to, to get up and running. Um, it may work for some in terms of, of pain management, but um, I just know that we've got a real problem with the, with the high prevalence of pills generally, and we need to uh, turn off the spigot and make sure that the right people are getting the right pills for the right reason. In all of your work and in your comments here tonight, civil rights and equality uh, figure so prominently. And I wonder what you think about the growing diversity of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, about issues of race and racial justice, and about immigration. Yeah. Well, there's a lot. That's a that. lot. There's a lot in that, in, that, uh, in that question. But this is something I feel really uh, passionately about. Um, one of the things that, well, there are a few things that I learned when I ran. Um, first, I, 
one of which I knew was that running, nobody knew who the heck I was because I'd never run for office before. Um, so I was running as an unknown. But the other thing that surprised me a little bit was that people didn't know what the Attorney General's office does. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how the Attorney General can help them. And particularly for those who I think the Attorney General is really there to serve, we better be there to stick up for the vulnerable. We better be there to give a voice to those who are voiceless, seniors, kids, people with disabilities, communities of color that have been traditionally unserved or underserved. So um, this is something I'm really passionate Clear. about. Yeah. And I think one of our jobs is to make sure that everybody in this state, no matter your race, no matter your socioeconomic status, no matter the zip code you live in, you have an opportunity, an opportunity to uh, participate in, in, in the basics of what I think about uh, for a civic society. You know, healthcare, education, employment, transportation access, uh, just to name housing, just to name a few. And we have a lot of work to do because there are a lot of disparities as you look across the state, um, both drawn on a color line and also on a, uh, an income line, and we have work to do. You know, I'm mindful that it's Thanksgiving. One in nine people in our state right now has, has food insecurity, is hungry, right? In Massachusetts, we can do better. Um, so one of the things I did to try to make people sort of feel like the AG's office the, is the people's law firm, belongs to them, is we set up a community engagement division. And so what we're doing is we've got this division and the job is basically to take the office to the streets, take the office to the neighborhoods. We've done community action hours in churches, in community centers, in boys and girls clubs, after hours. So between the, the time of five to nine, we've said to people, come with your issue. You got a wage complaint? You got a problem with a, a bad car loan? You've got a question about Corey and, and need help? Uh, come see us and, and let's meet people where they are. And I think that's one way that we've been, that we're trying to, to uh, uh, better connect with communities of color and immigrant communities, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. really add to the, the, the fabric of, of our state. We recently, last week we did a training in all Arabic on Know Your Rights. Uh, recently we've done uh, them in Portuguese and Spanish and Haitian Creole. And um, that's the kind of office I want to be. I want to be an office um, available and, and accessible to all. A people's lawyer. You know, one of the things I think many people who are not lawyers don't think a lot about is that law is not self-enforcing. That rights may be in a book, mm -hmm. but they don't come into mm -hmm. being unless somebody pursues them. Your office, that's your dedication. But you can't do everything. And so how do you leverage what you have? How do you partner? Well, um, one of the things I, I uh, am just so grateful for, I've just got a terrific team of colleagues, lawyers and non-lawyers, investigators, secretaries, paralegals, troopers, who day in and day out are thinking about this. And you have to prioritize, and you have to think about impact. Where can you have sort of the, 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 the greatest impact? And you know, one of the things that's, that's happened is, and I'll try to be uh, non-legal speak about this, but one of the things that happen, has happened is that the um, United States Supreme Court has basically uh, really cut out people's ability to seek relief when they get taken advantage of by banks or by uh, loan companies or by employers. Um, you've seen the uh, evisceration of, of what we call class action uh, principles and support that allow people to band together to fight uh, against a, an, an alleged wrong. Given that, Martha, I think that more of a burden falls on state attorneys generals to be there, to take on subprime predatory yes. lending, to take on unfair student lending practices, to take on the Volkswagens of the world, right, wow. um, who perpetrate terrible uh, corporate, uh, uh, corporate wrongdoing. Um, so part of it is, you know, thinking about big impact, sort of where can you have, where can you do the most for, for the most people. Um, but you know, you can't lose sight of the fact that you got to be there to help 
the person who's got a service animal who just tried to, to walk into a restaurant and was turned away. Because our job, I believe, we've got to do both. We've got to be there to help individuals who um, are discriminated against or whose rights are violated, but we also got to think about you know, what are the big impact areas Systems. and prioritize uh, around that. On the latter, how much do you think about collaborating with other attorney generals? Uh, how much do you think about a national strategy? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's an interesting uh, exercise. I think that there are some areas where state AGs can band together, although increasingly it's become far more partisan, I think, uh, which is unfortunate. There's a wonderful organization, the National Association of Attorneys Generals, and there's a lot of professional development and training that's provided through NAG, which is a terrible acronym, <laughs> NAG. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, um, you see, uh, you know, you see cases where there are state attorneys generals looking to take down Obamacare for the umpteenth time, looking to reverse marriage equality, looking to cut off and eliminate women's access to reproductive health care. So there are some states that I can work with and that we can work with in Massachusetts. <laughs> and then there are other states, you know, where we find ourselves on the other side of the V. That's happening now in some of our environmental cases oh, cool. where we are there as an office and I created, uh, when I came in, an Energy and Environment Bureau because I, I do believe that um, we are so past uh, the time to take seriously climate change and sustainability. I mean, this is a moral human you know, uh, issue. Survival. It is. And so we do things like stand up for President Obama and the EPA and support the regulations that they uh, uh, promulgate to, to uh, address greenhouse gases. But we have to defend that against states that sue to take those down. So there are some states we can work together with and, and other states you can't. But uh, certainly, you know, we find, uh, we, we find opportunities to band together where we can. And, and, it is, and it can be powerful when we do that. You referred to working with Governor Baker. Now that's also mm -hmm. interesting. So say some more. So. Um, we got to know each other a little bit over the course of, of the campaign and um, even played basketball uh, together before we, before we took office. You beat him, right? Barely. <laughs> Barely. Um, but, um, you know, I think we both recognized in running that the heroin opioid crisis was taking over the state and we both made it a top priority and our teams have been working really closely together uh, t on that issue. Um, and. It's a, it's a really important relationship. I, as I say, the, the, the problems that we face as a commonwealth when you think about healthcare costs, when you think about the cost of energy and, and what's happening and what our needs are, um, there are, are there are any number of ways that, that we can uh, work together and try to solve problems, right? right? At the end of the day, I think that's what a lot of people want out of their government and out of government actors. What are the, what are the problems right. and how can you solve them? Um, of course, when, when uh, he or his uh, uh, cabinet secretaries are sued, we're their lawyers. Yes, <laughs> so indeed. we have that, that relationship. But um, it's so as fascinating. Well. You know, Tom talked about the national system where the president appoints the attorney general. Yeah. We have a very different system here. I feel so blessed as I talk to colleagues around the country because um, uh, this is a position that is independently elected, constitutional office and we have the authority to enforce civil laws and criminal laws and uh, really answer to no one other than the voters of, of Massachusetts who gave us the privilege and the opportunity to serve. So look, this is why I think it's the greatest job in the world. Um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know much, I sure didn't know about politics or running for office, but I knew when I got in that this was the greatest job in the world um, because of, of, of you know, the power and the authority and the tools of, of the Massachusetts Attorney General's office. I'm going to ask just one or two other questions, so start thinking about what you want to ask. There are two microphones uh, in the aisles here, and when you line up, I will recognize you. Um, one question I, I'm really interested to ask you, a little selfishly, is that you're also a leader and you're also a manager of a large organization I hate it when people say to me, what's it like to be a woman in power? Like, I've never been anything else. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but still, there are issues, right? There are issues sometimes uh, about being, being seen as a leader, being seen as a role model, and are there aspects of your leadership style that you are very self-conscious of or in trying to demonstrate this is what it is to be a woman in leadership or not at all? Well, um, you know, I think that there, there are a few things that were very important to me at the outset. One of the first things that we did is we had a mandatory training for everybody in the office, everybody in the office on implicit bias. And boy, it was great. And it was hard and it challenged us, but I just thought this is where we need to be. It, it'll help us better interact with, with one another. Um, it'll help us in our recruiting and hiring um, and, and, and help us to better reflect mm -hmm. uh, the people we serve and to better serve uh, the people of this state. So that was something that I thought yeah. was really important as you think about the role of unconscious or implicit bias, whether it's with respect to gender or yeah. to race. I thought it was Age. an important thing to do. Yeah. Um, we also instituted paid parental leave. I just think it is, is so important um, to equality and, and gender uh, equality in particular. Um, we uh, did a, a review of our wages and compensation. Um, I wanted to see you know, what our own house mm -hmm. looked like. So you know, those are some of the, yes. the, the perspectives I think I, I brought to this, um, knowing a little bit about uh, discrimination and civil rights and being sort of mindful uh, right. of that and the tone that we wanted to, to set as an office. Um, some of it, you know, it's uh, my, my basketball, basketball is a team game. Yeah. And so, you know, my view is we are a, a team in that office mm -hmm. and we're only as strong as our weakest link. And it's about collaboration. It's about recognizing that everybody brings, and this is why it's important to have a diverse uh, workforce um, and, and a workforce of diverse experiences yeah. too, because everybody brings a different skill set or perspective yeah. to something, right? And I think we're richer yes. uh, for that. Um, but you know, it also means I'm going to be the first out there advocating equal pay for equal work, transgender equality in this state, and and addressing some of the disparities that we've talked about when it comes to race. So my last question is about new media. How do you relate to the tweeting of the world and to <laughs> email and texting? And is it something that you have a Facebook page? And is it something that you think is an important way to be the people's lawyer or stay far away from all of that? Oh, no, we're all over it. I, gotta, I, I have a social media person, actually, director, who does that because we know that is a great way for us to connect with people whether it's Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Listen to this. Um, wow. No, my team will laugh and make fun of me. <laughs> um, uh, no, we had to say, we do a lot with little videos too because we find that, um, and we pay attention to this because it's about how, how do you make sure you're connecting with people. So right. we pay attention to, you know, hits on, hits on the site and, and what times of the day people tune in and, you know, what kind of um, image or, or visual they, they are more likely to pay attention to because I want them getting the information. Yeah. Right. You know, when we put information out for consumers or when we put information out about landlord tenant law, we did that at the start of school this year actually because all the kids coming into Boston, I wanted to make sure they knew what their rights were. This is how we've got to connect, yes. you know, yes. and this is how we, you know, we need to be fresh and cutting edge in Massachusetts. Um, given the number of young people, given uh, the, tech the innovation <laughs> in this state, we, we need to have and should have the most innovative uh, cutting edge social media program. It's not there yet, I'm open to, end, but we're, we're working on it. It's fantastic. So questions, please come up and line up. Uh, thank you. And as you do, if you would be willing to identify yourself, your name, where you're from, that'd be great. Uh, I'm Bob Binney. Is this working? Yeah. I think now it's on. Yeah. Great. Um, Thanks. You are a breath of fresh air. You truly are. That's number one. Number two, I'd like you to answer, if you know this, are you the first professional basketball player that ever became an attorney general? <laughs> That's number two. Number three, I like, I know there's so much fear and uh, people are just stick, sticking their head in the sand with this Syrian mm -hmm. refugee crisis. And I'd like to just hear your comments on sure. that, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Well, um, I don't know if I'm the first, and 
Jim Tierney can probably answer that question. I know I'm the shortest. I think I can <laughs> safely, I can safely say that. Um, so Syria, um, you know, here's what I, here's what I think about that issue. Of course, we need to do everything we can to protect public safety, to protect uh, the integrity of, of of this country, and keep people safe. That goes without saying. And of course, state, local, and federal officials need to be in regular communication and need to make sure that, that all steps and measures are being taken. But I was so disheartened this week uh, and last week to, to listen to the, the discourse, if you even want to call it that in some respects. Um, and I think about, for many of us in this room, our grandparents, our great-grandparents who came to this country as immigrants, I think about those who came to this country as refugees, whether they were f survivors of, of the Holocaust and fleeing, uh, survivors of, of the Armenian genocide, the 100th anniversary we just commemorated. Uh, I, I think of my friends in Lowell and, and the Cambodian population. I mean, we could just go on and on. And this country, of course it's about standing strong, and we gotta do everything we can to stand up to and, f and fight against global terrorism. But you better believe it, we need to stand strong for our values, who we are as a nation, what got us to this point, and never, ever turn our back on those in need. And I don't know how you can watch the news, look at the paper, and see the images, these mothers um, changing their babies yeah. in fields, uh, these young kids uh, hopping off life rafts and, and not know that, that, that saying no or saying you're not welcome is not American and, and not who we need to be. So that's where I am, Bob, on that. Thank you. Say your name and... Yeah, of course, uh, my name is Dwayne DeSonia, and I'm a resident of Boston over in Jamaica Plain. Congrats on your success uh, so far in the position. And um, congrats especially on the outreach that you take. And I think it's fundamentally important to the effectiveness of, of the office. So that's terrific. Um, and I gladly contribute to your future campaigns, uh, assuming <laughs> I haven't lost it all on DraftKings. Uh, oh, we're, we're trying to look out for you there, too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, serious question, though, about uh -huh. opioids. And you've addressed uh -huh. it a little bit this evening. We have a family on our street that is literally in crisis um, tonight because of an opioid addiction. Mm. And I've been stunned to hear more about their story and how difficult it is to get the physician to ease back on the prescriptions. Mm -hmm. um, the spouse has been calling, and to the point where the, the doctor's office literally hangs up, um, can't help mm -hmm. you. Uh, so in the work that you're doing, what are the chances, you think, of a change in standard of care, regulations, and law? And do you think that's something that actually uh, can be effective as a part of, admittedly, a really complicated yeah. situation. Well, you know, I'm so sorry to hear about that family. These are the kinds of stories we hear about all the time. And um, I think that this is why we need legislation. There's legislation that's been proposed around prescribing limits. Now we can debate how many days uh, it should be, and I'm heartened to see the Massachusetts Medical Society say and agree that some limitation guardrails, guidelines are appropriate. Um, that's something we need to sort out and make happen as soon as possible. Um, because the fact of the matter is, too many people can become addicted too quickly in a matter of days to something that, it, that is just absolutely devastating. We also need to, to uh, make sure that prescribers are given the opportunity though to learn about alternatives to pain medication um, and, and different approaches. They need to be supported in this. There are a lot of people who come through the doors looking for help from, from doctors. They may not want to do the physical therapy. Time is short, lives are busy, and they'll take the pills. And here's, a, here's where I say we all need to do a better job of being educated as consumers and as patients, um, making sure we ask the right questions. In our office, we've actually gone after some doctors who have been uh, pumping and prescribing pills out in, in uh, unsafe and unlawful amounts. And you know, we'll continue to, to do that work. 
Um, I think we need to work with licensing boards um, for doctors and dentists and others so that they are trained on appropriate prescribing practices and so that they're held accountable for, for those practices because lives are at stake. This is serious, serious business. Hi, thank you both for this wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. My name is Eric Shulga. I'm an uh, English teacher at a local charter school. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two questions, both related to charter school and the law governing them. Uh, the first one is, what does the law say about uh, school enrollment and whether or not, was, does it say that um, student demographics in charter schools need to mirror the areas they serve? Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, do you have any thoughts on the recent story in the Boston Globe last week about charter school employees using public funds to advocate for political causes like the lift and the charter cap? Hmm. So um, I think what you're pointing to is the important discussion that we're having right now in the state. It's happening at the legislature. Uh, there's a proposal to lift or to raise the cap on charter schools here in the state. There's also a lawsuit that's been filed um, against the state that our office is defending as the Attorney General represents and defends the state and when a law is challenged, it's our job to defend that law. So it's an important time right now, it's an important discussion. I'll tell you where I come from on this. Um, to me, it's about ensuring and uh, remedying the fact that some of our poorest students across this state are not receiving the education they deserve. Everything sh should be done to address that, in my view. Um, I, uh, I think about the consequences of not doing that. You're an English teacher, right? and I, I mentioned literacy and how important that is um, in, in development and what failure to ensure a, an educated uh, student body can, can, or student can, can look like and result in. So that's where we need to be with, with everything we, doing everything we can to, to support um, education investment. We'll see what the legislature does. That's not in my hands. Um, and we'll see what the court does. That's uh, not exactly in our hands either. But I sure hope that um, we get to a place where there is far more investment and attention paid to education um, in this state. The second question, I guess, was about lobbying by charter school teachers, and I, they might generalize that to lobbying by any kind of government official. Um, are there restrictions? Should there be? Are charter school employees public officials? I guess it depends, right? Some are and some, yeah. some depends. aren't. Yeah. have to know the specifics. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've seen and, and we've heard from, I think that, I think that when it comes to lobbying, um, and I'll probably get myself in trouble here. I think the lobbying that is most effective is the lobbying that comes from uh, uh, people, uh, real people who are aggrieved and not necessarily the lobbyists. People who can talk about their story, you know, and tell their story. And it doesn't really matter the issue. Um, and I always encourage that kind of, it doesn't really matter what the issue. I, I, I think that that kind of civic engagement is good and Petition and the government, constitutional right? right. Absolutely. Right. And, and overturn Citizens United. Get rid of that. <laughs> Thank you. I think you've been waiting, so please yes. identify yourself. Okay. Thank you. I'm Carol Donovan, a former state rep, retired mm -hmm. state rep. And I'm a firm supporter of the governor's uh, bill on the opiates. And I think you are too, Mara. I don't mm -hmm. think you have any problem. How do I deal with my friends who are members of the ACLU, which I mm -hmm. was a Mm -hmm. proud caring member in the past. How do I deal with them when they tell me it's against the law to hire somebody uh, for, or to keep somebody for 72 hours in a hospital? Well, um, let's, let, so let's, just a little context here. The governor's uh, legislation, there are a lot of aspects to it. There, uh, there are pieces that set prescribing limits for, for doctors. There's a piece that would require hospitals to hold patients for a certain amount of time, uh, commit them essentially uh, so that they can get access to, to treatment or help. There is mandatory training for um, students in school. Um, there's just a, a variety of, of things in this legislation. And I think that 
you know, the thrust of the legislation, it is where we need to be, it is in the right direction. That specific issue about commitment, here's what I think is important there. I think that um, this is about a system for getting people into treatment. I think a question that, that, and a detail that needs to be answered is where are the beds? Where are the, where are the programs? Because we don't want to see people held uh, in an ER or in a hospital. Um, we want to see them uh, in a treatment setting, in an appropriate clinical treatment setting. I think that's the, something that, that, that is, is very much and should be the discussion right now mm -hmm. as this legislation gets debated. What does that look like? So I would just encourage folks to uh, keep an open mind um, and let's try to shift to sort of what what do treatment and placement options look like? And is there a way that we can better intervene? Because I think that's mm -hmm. what this is about. You know, the other day, uh, not the other day, this was a couple months ago, I was at home in, in Charlestown and I was going out to work and um, there's a park that, I, that our house is, is, is on and there was a young man on a bench and he had just used uh, the firefighters were making their way over and I walked over with them. He was still in hospital scrubs. Mm -hmm. He had just been let out the day before mm -hmm. from a hospital, having OD'd. Mm -hmm. And when he came to, the first thing he said to us was, can somebody take me to Cambridge Hospital? Wow. So, you know, how do we respond to, how do we help people like that? Um, that's a challenge, um, but it. it's one we gotta meet. Get on a different path. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi, so my name is Manuel Castro. I'm a student at UMass Boston, um, and I'm actually interning for the Attorney General. All right. Um, so I guess a question for you, Martha, and for Hello. you, Maura. Um, Martha, I watched dozens of your interviews uh -oh. from Justice Associate, from Associate Justice Kagan um, to Maura. How, as a moderator, do you kind of choose the questions to kind of share and convey information with us audiences? Um, like, what do you feel is most important? And then to you, Maura, um, a lot of us in the office are very inspired by Maura, um, and I see a lot of leaders in this room. So to you, Maura, I know a lot of leaders and people who are high achievers get tired. How do you like reset the clock every morning and keep going to make it look so graceful? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, great question. I want to hear the answer to that uh, one. Um, I, we've got a lot of energy in the office, and thank you for the work you do in the office on behalf of the people. Um, I hope you're having a good experience. I'm, I'm grateful for the interns that come through our doors and hope it does inspire them someday to, to take up public service and to want to return in some capacity to the Attorney General's office. Look, um, inspiration is not hard for me. You know, I see it in, in, in the faces of the people I meet day in and day out, listening to their stories, hearing about their needs. Um, you know, some of it is desperate, some of it's really sad, and it leaves you fired up to want to do you know, and I think it leaves us as a team fired up to want to do all we can to, to help and to use. It's an incredible privilege to work in the office and to have the opportunity to, to try to do something for someone, to try to make a difference. Um, I'm also inspired by something that surprised me. I didn't see this coming, but there's a lot of goodwill out there. You know, there's a lot of goodwill, and there are a lot of people that want to see us succeed, that want to see us succeed so that people succeed, right? So that people are helped. And they want to help um, bridge that. You know, I, I, you heard my comments about deflate gate. Because I'm asking, that's another thing. Your attorney general, they ask you about anything and everything. <laughs> like, like you're supposed to have an opinion. So I get asked about Tom Brady and deflate gate, to which my response is far, much, far too much time spent on air pressure. NFL ought to be thinking about and talking about domestic violence and sexual assault. Here, here. Pervasive in the league. But, you know, that, that resulted in, uh, shortly, a little while later, I received a call from Robert Kraft and saying, let's team up, let's do something. Wow. And, you know, um, we uh, cooked up this program called Game Change, where we're now going into schools free of charge starting in 2016. Uh, through a curriculum developed by Northeastern Center for Sports and Society and building in domestic violence agencies who also stepped forward and wanted to join in this. We got this program called Game Change. We're gonna teach and train teachers, coaches, parents 
on preventing and responding to and intervening um, on issues of violence. And we're going to train students, too, so that they build and develop better emotional competencies so that hopefully we see less relationship violence and gang violence and gun violence. But that just happens because there are people in this state who are willing to step forward and willing to partner. And that's inspiring to me and, and to us as an office. So um, for me, it's just an unbelievable privilege and honor to be able to ask people I admire questions. And I'm selfish. I'm curious. <laughs> I ask the questions that I want to know the answers to. I, I did uh, have the honor of recently interviewing Associate Justice Alana Kagan. She had been my student, so that one wasn't intimidating. <laughs> um, and she later became my colleague and then my boss. Mm -hmm. And now as I tease her, she writes my teaching materials. Mm. Um, <laughs> So, but for me, it's, it is a great privilege. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Brendan Rooney. I'm a junior in high school at Catholic Memorial, alongside my classmates. Um, mm. And I think I speak for all of us when we say um, we're very grateful that uh, you feel so strongly about the, uh, the issue of student loan debt uh, that's you know, staring at us down in the mm. future. But how difficult will it be to get uh, private universities and private colleges on board with trying to lower tuition costs where they may not receive the public funding that a school such as UMass might receive? Yeah. It's a really important conversation right now, Brendan. Um, and I'm looking out at all of you in your blazers. You all look so sharp. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the fact of the matter is, I believe that the cost of, of college nationally has grown 60%, increased 60% since 2000. I mean, it is a, it is a serious problem. And I think for... The, the private colleges, though I'm maybe not the best one to speak um, on this uh, stage uh, to yeah. the issue, I mean, the fact of the matter is they're not going to have students. They're not going to be able, people aren't going to be able to afford to go. Um, so, you know, I don't know where this, this gets us if there aren't some, some changes. And um, I think we need to look at that. I think we need to look at what's driving cost. Um, I also think it's a, it really important, too, with this on-demand economy um, and with some of the industry, even if you look within Massachusetts, we have to remember that a four-year liberal arts education, I received that. I had a wonderful experience. It may not be for everyone. There are lots of ways to work and make a living in our community, in our state, in our country. And I think we need to evolve a little bit more and support the vocational programs, support some of the trade programs that frankly may better suit people and set them up for fulfilling careers. So I think that uh, we're at an interesting time right now. But look, um, that's what I'm talking about uh, when I say this is a crisis and you are our future uh, and you are, our, our, you are our future employees, but you're our future. And, uh, and we need to be doing everything we can. I think it's important that it's been the national discussion. I think you see it in the, the presidential uh, uh, debates. Um, and, and that's absolutely right. And I wish you all the best. What year are you? Uh, junior in high school. Junior, okay, you've got time. Don't be stressed. That's the other thing. If I might just offer this to young people, I think there's a lot of burden and strain and stress and pressure put on young people. A stress and a strain that I didn't feel or know growing up uh, when I was your age. And I think it's just important that, um, that you not succumb to that. Um, life is long, you'll have a lot of paths, you'll take a lot of turns, you want to explore a lot of things. And if I'm any example, I sure could never have predicted uh, where I'd end up sitting, sitting in your shoes many years ago. So uh, try to have some fun, enjoy it along the way, be good to each other, right? Um, but don't be afraid to take chances and do things that may even be unconventional because it'll make you a lot happier in the long run. Thank you very much. Mark, Carol Hillman from Brookline. Hi, Mara. Hi, Carol. Hi. Thanks, first of all, for all the wonderful new, new initiatives you've mentioned in your office. I think they're going to go a long way to helping <clears throat> the citizens of this country, of the state. Um, you mentioned the two words, draft kings. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit on what you 
see happening there? What are your objectives? Mm -hmm. And especially in light of the fact that, on the other hand, we are inviting gambling institutions into the Commonwealth. Mm. Thank you. Well, Carol, you know, when I was running, there were some things that I uh, envisioned dealing with, the heroin opioid crisis that we talked about, gun violence, consumer issues. Daily fantasy sports, not on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what makes the job fun. So new industry, big industry. Um, and what we did in the office was we had to, to look at the facts, look at this industry, try to understand what was happening. And I came to the, we came to the decision that at this, uh, at this juncture, um, what, what exists in terms of the laws doesn't neatly match up with what this industry is about. Yes, it is a form of gambling. It is gambling. Um, we can debate skill, chance, all that. It doesn't really interest me. What interests me as Attorney General is making sure that we have the strongest, most robust consumer protections in place. The industries will either be able to comply with that or they will not be able to do business here. Um, I know that other offices have taken other approaches. The New York Attorney General has sought to set them, shut them down uh, based on existing uh, criminal law in New York. I have to look at Massachusetts law. And, um, and, and what we've done, we just announced this the other day, was uh, I had a team that worked really hard in the office that over a relatively short period uh, did a thorough review, looked at a lot of documents, got a lot of information from this company, these companies, and we just recently uh, came out with the strongest consumer protections in the country um, on this issue. Um, we'll see how things go going forward. Our investigation continues, um, but in the meantime, that is the approach we're taking so that there's no uh, play by anybody under 21. There's no play on college sports. That, if you want to play this game, you're cut off at $1,000 a month until and unless you can demonstrate an ability to absorb more losses than that. Um, really full disclosures, um, no insider play or use of insider information. Um, I imagine um, they may be challenged. I imagine that the companies in the industry is not happy uh, with all of what we've proposed, but I think that's the right thing to do by consumers here in the state. And um, the discussion will continue if the legislature or the Gaming Commission wish to take it up, um, uh, whether it's to think about revenue sharing or taxation, they can do that. But I wanted to do uh, take immediate action on, on what is our existing authority, which is consumer protection regs. So uh, that's, um, that's where we are on, on that issue. Your th themes uh, you are so clearly do the right thing, do it on behalf of ordinary people, be the people's lawyer, help people understand their rights. Would everyone join me in thanking our Attorney General, yeah, Laura Healy? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I want to thank Dean Minow for um, her, her job here tonight. I've long admired her work um, and, and the work of her law school. We have terrific law school interns and, and assistants in our office, them. so we appreciate that. And it is incredibly humbling. I'm looking at my parents who brought my sister and uh, the rest of us here at early ages. Um, and anytime anybody, cousin, come over from Ireland, this was the first stop on, on the tour. <laughs> so. Um, it is incredibly humbling to, to me and I'm sure to my family to, to be at, uh, at the library here this, this evening and uh, we will do our best in the Attorney General's office to honor the amazing legacy of the Kennedy family and the work that we do. represents the best of public service. If people want to come and talk to her right now, she's willing to stay a little bit. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.